But welcome to everybody here again and uh, on the live stream uh, as you are sprinkled as salt in various areas. Welcome from here in Spanish Fort in Lower Alabama or L.A. as we call it. Every holy day in the spring uh, for the last few years, I'm really happy to be here in the United States to observe that because for decades, well, for a very long time, we uh, just were not here. So I'm going to have to keep her awake, so I'll work on that. <laughs> I heard a yawn, so that's okay. Um, I understand. So, but I'll, I'll do my best. Well, here we are already. What day of unleavened bread is it? Real quick. Don't have time to calculate. Fifth day. Hi. Fifth day. That means there's two more days. Tomorrow and then Monday will be the last day of unleavened bread. I trust you had a very good night to be much observed. And the first four days of unleavened bread, uh, the spiritual fellowship has been uh, inspiring. And I hope we'll take advantage of that. My wife and I know we sure enjoy the time together. And thanks for all of you uh, out there as well as here for making it special. Turn with me if you would. Let's get right into it. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And let's begin in verse 14. This day shall be unto you for a memorial. Okay? And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by a statute forever. The Hebrew word forever meaning Olam is endless. It hinges on what? What's involved and who's involved, which is God. Verse 15, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. It doesn't say only when you eat unleavened bread you must eat it. Well, the church has the authority to make that decision. No, it doesn't. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall you put away leaven out of your houses that's interesting, the first day. Does it say that three weeks before you put all the leaven out of your house? De leaven? Every little nook and cranny, boy, it's showing how spiritual you are if you're getting rid of all that leaven. It just says even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your house. By the way, that decision that said you don't have to eat it, Every day came from a fellowship that some are from, uh, offshoot out of. In April of 1982, the decision was made and carried on by the church, not the Bible. You shall put leaven for whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day shoal shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day, okay, First day of the seven, 15th of Abib, there shall be a holy convocation. That's what we're having today. This is a holy convocation set apart by God. In the seventh day, which would be what? And in the seventh day, the 21st of Abib, there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them. This kind of relates to what we were talking about before, doesn't it? Save that which every man must eat that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in the 15th of Abib, the selfsame day, have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by a statute forever. Why do I use the word statute instead of ordinance? Well, do some Bible study and see if you figure that out. If not, let me know. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. 
For whosoever eats that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Part and parcel with the Passover season is this time referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's unique. In the way God commanded it to be kept in its meaning and further its intent. Remember, Christ came to magnify the law and make it honorable. So even the intent of a sin, the thought behind it, the intentions. We had a saying growing up, the road to hell, we don't believe you go to hell, by the way. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach you go to heaven either. I saw a post this morning. This is the only way you're going to get to heaven. Sorry, when we die, we don't go to heaven. That's what the Bible teaches. Christianity doesn't teach that, but God's Word says, John chapter 3, no man has ascended to heaven except Jesus the Christ. And when you die, you're dead. You're in the grave until the resurrection. And when you're resurrected, you don't go to heaven, folks. That's a Bible basic. That's not what the world teaches I don't care what the world teaches. I have to teach what the Word of God teaches. But it's unique. It's meaning and it's intent. And Christ said, if you even look on a woman, you've committed the sin. If you look on that, oh, i got to have three more dishes of ice cream when you've had enough. Or you're going to go buy something that you already have. What your wife says or your husband says, we already have what we need. No, I'm going to get Another one. Whatever. So the intent. Well, I never intended to hurt somebody. Right? Most people don't think about that's, I don't intend to cause those problems. And so, but the focus of these days of unleavened bread, and this is what we're going to talk about today. If you want a title, for some of you that like titles, and it will be on the website with the and the YouTube channel a few hours here after services or maybe within a day. The Days of Unleavened Bread, dot, 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 finding our way out. Let me explain. Most of us understand very clearly the symbolism during these days in leavening that it is used negatively as symbolic of sin, evil, and unrighteousness. We all get that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because Paul made an association with the spiritual leaven quite clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, the the situation going on here, we'll talk about that in a little bit. It is reported commonly. It's quite well known. It's talked about. The people that like to chatter, chatter, chatter are talking all about this. That there is fornication among you, and such is not so much as named among the nations, that one should have his father's wife, his stepmother. That's incestuous. Am I wrong? Strictly, absolutely forbidden by God. Today's society, hey, whatever floats, your canoe, go for it. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, I have already found this man guilty as though I were present concerning him that some has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you were gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such as one over to Satan for the destruction of flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump? 
So just as leavening products will, in a relatively small quantity, thoroughly permeate whatsoever they're in, sin, even in small, minute quantities, if left, left unchecked, will thoroughly permeate our lives. And during these days, if you look at and say, where have I, where am I doing things that really need to be eradicated and removed? You'll find plenty. I know I have and do. If you don't find any, then that's another issue. God's use of leavening is an interesting one. Yeast, for example, which this word here that says leavening actually could say yeast in verse 6, is a one-celled organism that feeds on sugars and carbohydrates. Many times people say, what's the big deal with carbs? Because they turn to sugar almost immediately. Diabetics should know that. It gives off, it turns sugars and carbohydrates, gives off carbon monoxide, small amounts of alcohol in the process. It causes bread to rise due to the pockets of gas that are trapped within the fibers of the dough. When the bread is baked, the alcohol evaporates, the yeast is killed, and the carbon dioxide filters out, leaving holes in the bread filled with air. Hence, oh, this is so big and fluffy. The bread dough is altered, but listen to what I'm about to say. Nothing of any substance is left behind. The application of sin is striking. Sin, and as we heard from Joe Myers, and pride and vanity that often he accompany it, will cause us to be puffed up. It will deny a relationship with God. How many of you remember the song, You're So Vain? I think it was Carly Simon. You probably think this song is about you. You walked in to the party. All the focus was on moi. You think you're pretty intelligent. You think you're pretty gifted. You think you're pretty tough. You think you're pretty fill in the blank. God says, don't be like that. Well, we are altered, but in the final analysis, there will be nothing of substance with us that God can use if we don't replace the leaven with Christ and God the Father and that Spirit in us. We will just be empty. Have you ever told someone, you are full of hot air, shut up? You're just a big windbag. You're full of air. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's, people say that all the time. The commercial manufacturing of yeast provides an interesting angle. The yeast bacteria are grown in a carefully controlled broth of corn, barley, and water. The yeast is harvested and pressed to remove the liquid before it is packaged and sold. As for the broth, once the yeast is harvested, it is poured out because it is what? Of no value. Similarly, if we allow ourselves to become a conduit, a medium for sin to grow in, the final analysis, we will likewise what? Be of no value. Not to God, not to our fellow men, and no value even to our adversary, Satan. He'll kick us off and say, I got them, no good, done. And then some will be discarded. If they continue and don't want to change that and they just reject God to the lake of fire. So going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, I should have told you to keep your finger there. Therefore, what does God command through Paul? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. It's a holy day, so if you plan on working Monday, you need to take that up with God. Well, I have to work to provide. I got bills. No, you're breaking the Sabbath, the holy day, if you will. Not the Saturday Sabbath, you're breaking the holy day. Let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, malicious wickedness, our old mind, neither with the leaven of malice, right? 
and wickedness, actively doing what he was talking about here, it is commonly reported, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, when we deleaven our homes, it's a worthy event. Just don't lose the physical examination apart, which is totally can, I mean, don't lose the spiritual application to where you get all the crumbs out, but you don't for a minute look at your life and say, where do I need to change and stop thinking and doing these things? And for those who claim this is not a festival to be kept by the Christians today, Paul disagrees with that in verse 8. He says, you need to, as God inspired, and to be keeping this. So we are quite literally commanded to keep this feast. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Verse 31. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you from among my people, you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks, your herds, you have said, and be gone, and have mercy on me, if you will. <laughs> have mercy, bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent. You know, get out of here upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we're going to be all dead men if you're not out of here. The people took their dough, before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders, and the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they spoiled of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they gave unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. Roughly two to two and a half million people, maybe four, I don't think six. And a mixed multitude went with them as well, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. So those of you that say, well, Satan's not in our church, he's not in our feast site, he's never in our midst, oh, ho, ho, it's magic, you know, remember that song? He's very much alive and well. How dare you make that comment? I'm just saying, I know he is. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt. It was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt, and they didn't waste any time, neither had they prepared for themselves any food. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. I heard somebody say the other night, oh, it was 400 years. No. And at 430, and it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed. Like a lot of people say, no, it's remembered. It says, I'm reading what the Bible says, it is a night to be much observed. Yes, remembered, but observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt, the night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. That's why we keep that in remembrance of that. So this was the actual physical Exodus from Egypt. Scholars debate whether it occurred in 1200 B.C., 1450, whatever. It had to have been an incredible event. Upwards of 3 million Hebrews plus a mixed multitude complete with their entire households, livestock, and the plunder of Egypt. And I can hear Mark Graham's song. The people were singing in the animals too. Quite an uplifting song. Mark did a great job on that. I want to read this again. I've done it years ago. I want to read this. Uh, I like details. You know that. This is called Moses' math problem. How do you handle a horde of hungry Hebrews habitating in a hostile hot desert? You get that? It's almost overwhelming when you think about it. Moses and the people were in the desert, but what was he going to do with them? They had to be fed, 
Now imagine feeding, you know, we feed 50 people or so at the feast, generally. Feeding two or three million people requires a lot of food. Bruce, I'm sorry you're a master barbecuer, but you can't handle that. According to the Quartermaster General of the Army, it's calculated that Moses would have needed 1,500 tons of food each day to feed the Israelites. To bring that much food each day, two freight trains each a mile long would be required. Besides that, you must remember they were out in the deserts. So they would have to have firewood to use in cooking the food, theoretically. This would take 4,000 tons of wood and a few more freight trains, such each a mile long, just for one day, and think they were 40 years in transit. And oh yes, they would have to have water. Ice water. No, they would have had to have water. If they only had enough to drink, cook, and wash a few dishes, if they had dishes, it would take 11 million gallons each day and a freight train with tank cars three miles long just to bring the water. And another thing, they had to get across the Red Sea in one night, right? <clears throat> now, if they went on a narrow path, double file, the calculation I came up, the line would be 800 miles long and would require 35 days and nights to get through. Besides all the people who were large droves of livestock. I can't even get what I used to have a dog to do what I asked, much less a flock of sheep. Or... So there had to be space in the Red Sea three miles wide so they could walk 5,000 abreast to get over in one night. But then there's another little problem. Each time they camped at the end of the day, a campground two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island was required, roughly 750 square miles. Think of it, this space just for nightly camping. Do you think Moses figured all this out before he left Egypt? I don't think so. You see, Moses believed in God. God took care of a lot of these things for him and them. So when you think God has problem taking care of your horrible needs and all your problems, no. So have you ever stopped to think with all that as background? Why did they have to leave Egypt? Stay with me here. After all, couldn't they have served God from within Egypt? Couldn't they have worked into respectable positions within Egyptian society with God's help and lived well blending in with Egypt? Why did God require them to, as we say, salida in Spanish, to exit, to come out? The answers is what I want to talk about provide some interesting parallels for you and me to consider as well. I have several points I wish to look at with you during this message. Number one, they could not worship God and stay exactly as they were. Go back to Exodus chapter 1, and verse 8. Exodus 1 and verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it comes to pass when there falls out any war, they join our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of our land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. I'm not going to make any comments about that. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. It wasn't extermination, but a concentration of people made to work extremely under difficult decisions. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. Another analogy with being enslaved to sin as if being in bondage. In mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field and all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. They spent a total of 430 years 
in Egypt. How much of it they spent in this harsh slavery, we don't know for certain. It may not have been terribly long because Israel still had some knowledge of God. But as slaves, their lives were not their own. The ability to keep the Sabbath and the holy days would have clearly been taken away from them. And the worship of false gods would undoubtedly be introduced and even demanded. Adam Clark's commentary says, With cruelty, great oppression, they became weary of life through the severity of their servitude, with hard bondage, with grievous servitude. This was the general character of the life in Egypt. It was a life of the most painful servitude, oppressive enough in itself, but made much more by the cruel manner of their treatment while performing their task. So if Israel was to be God's people, his servants, listen carefully. They could not be servants to someone else too. We are told in many places, Exodus 34, verse 14, that our God is a jealous God. He demands our total attention and devotion, not one day a week on the Sabbath or at Passover at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's it. He will not share worship or devotion with anyone or anything else. That can be a wife, a husband, a family member, a job, a relative, a church, your friends, your dogs, your cats, your house. Let's go to Joshua chapter 24. My Bible's stuck together. It must have gotten hot. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 13. God says here, Joshua reminded the people, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them or the vineyards and olive yards which you planted yet you do not eat. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord. If it did, choose you this day whom you will serve. The gods with your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. Joshua reminded them they had picked up to worship of Egypt's gods. From the past, they were not to bring them to worship into their lives now. They were to choose, either worship the true God or another God. But you can't do both, friends. We can't. The parallels are not rocket science. They're not too mysterious. We've already seen leavening as representative sin, therefore putting leavening out of our homes and off our properties. We are showing in symbol the need for hard work and putting sinful practices and thoughts out of our lives. Yesterday, I thought, I'm going to go to Subway. And I was headed that way. Well, I mean, I was going to drive. I was headed that direction. I was going to get in the car and drive over there. And I thought, no, I'm not. What kind of bread do you want on that? That would have probably got me. Uh, mm, Sorry. (coughs) It takes work. (coughs) It takes work if you want to go find out. If the Spanish Fort Toros are winning, it's Friday night. Let it go. Don't. Let it go. It don't matter. Oh, it does too. Yeah, we got to know. Got these notifications to my phone whether the college football team in this state, if they're winning, got to know that. So Romans chapter 6, let's go over there. Romans chapter 6. Verse 15. See, we need to understand you need to come out of this society 
out of this world, not during this week, but on a daily basis. You need to say, what things am I doing are not taking me out of the world? They're putting me right back in it. I like it there. Right? You have a massive heart attack to tell you, you need to stop eating all this red meat. You need to stop eating. You're diabetic. You need to stop eating these things. You have fill in the blank. You've had a stroke. You can't do these things. You need to exercise. We can do that when we're forced to. But other things, not so much. Right? I have a challenge for all of you. Matter of fact, I'm going to take it one really offensive step further. I bet, gentlemen's bet, you can't not check your Facebook or social media or look at your phone from now until sundown tonight. I bet you can't do it if you're addicted to it like all the rest of us. You have to check it. You have to know. You have to post. I always get a kick out of what I see posted that shows it was posted right during church services. So I know you're on it. Don't tell me. I'm using it for my Bible. (laughs) Right. Maybe you are. In part. We can't. We've become part of society. Well, now you're you're stopped preaching and now you're meddling. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? Look at this word all the way through every scripture. His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But thank be th- God be thanked that you were, past tense, the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. This word servant is the Greek word doulos. It means, here we go, oh no, slave! Oh, how dare you use that word? The oppression. Oh. I'm glad I've not woken up to this whole thing. Or one in bondage. I speak after, we have verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded our members to slave the uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, Rome was a very wicked society. Even now so yield your members slaves or servants to righteousness and holiness. For when you were the slaves or servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in these things where you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become a slave to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the summarization or the summation of what Paul has been saying. Once again, we see that our God will not allow divided loyalties. Even many national governments will not allow dual citizenship because it implies a divided loyalty they will not permit. So God requires us to declare our citizenship to Him and live it. And that means what? Coming out of sin. Remember, sin is not just something we do. It's a mindset, and it becomes a total way of life. So sin is literally something we can be completely immersed in, in all that we do. And that's the rub. Second Peter chapter 2, let's go over there, please. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity and lure through the lust of the flesh through much wantonness, because that they were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. That word also can mean, from Proverbs 21 to liberalism. 
For of whom a man is overcome of the same is brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to even have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And this is pretty graphic, but it's God's word. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, which is, I think, 2611, the dog has turned to his own vomit. My dog used to do this, and then eat it all up. And the kids and us would go, oh, wow, I don't want any dinner now. And the sow has washed in her wallowing in the mire. Peter was warning of false teachers who would strive, perhaps even sincerely, to draw God's people away from the truth. Under the influence of our adversary, they try to lure us away from God. Sexual acceptance, monetary power, influence. And this is very much still alive within the church today, folks. Yes, it is. Oh, you've lost it. No. If you have eyes to see. So my questions, friends and brethren, to you. What is it that motivates you and me? These are the three most common areas for motivation in society. You ready for them? You'll say, that ain't me. Yes, it is you. Yes, it's me. Love and acceptance. Everyone needs it. But can you be convinced to give up your convictions in order to be with someone who would promise you that? One person told me when they were getting married to someone who had no clue what they believed and wanted and cared, this might be my only chance. Is God big enough to provide for you what you need when you need it? I have to be part of this church on Sunday or Saturday, this group, because I, I'm accepted there. They love me. These are my friends. The minister loves me. Wrong reason to be there. Are they teaching the truth? Have you ever closely examined it? Well, I know they're fine. Why, everybody says they are. Have you proven what they teach? Does it align with the Word of God? Well, sort of. It's what we've always taught. They know what they're doing. Really? Is God big enough to provide for you what you need when you need it? I'd like to read a poem that I put in my Bible decades ago. I made a photocopy of it so it doesn't page doesn't come out, but it's in my Bible. I glued it there. It's called El Shaddai. I'm going to read this, see if you can relate to it. I hope you can. Here's what it looks like photocopied. Everyone longs to give themselves completely to someone, to have a deep soul relationship with another, to be loved thoroughly and exclusively. But God to a Christian, a true Christian, says, no, not until you are satisfied, fulfilled, and content with being loved by me alone with giving yourself totally and unreservedly to me, to having an intensely personal and unique relationship with me alone, discovering that only in me is your satisfaction to be found, till you be capable of the perfect you. I want us to think about this. This is why in the world there's so many people divorced and remarried constantly. And that when young people are dating, when they first get married, they think they're just going to sleep together all day long and they'll live on love. You will never be united with another until you're united with me. Exclusively of any desires or longings, I want you to stop wanting, planning, wishing, complaining, belly aching, griping. Allow me to give you the most thrilling plan existing, one that you cannot imagine. I want you to have the best. Please allow me, if it's my will, to bring it to you. God's not moving fast enough. You ever think that? 
Keep listening and learning all the things I tell you and read. You must wait and listen. That's all. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't look around at things others have gotten or that I've given them. Don't look at the things you think you want. Keep looking up and away at me or you'll miss what I want to show you. And then when you're ready, I'll surprise you with a love far more wonderful than anything you would dream of. You see, until the one I have for you is ready, I'm working even at this moment to have both of you ready at the same time, until you are both satisfied exclusively with me, and the life I've prepared for you, you won't be able to experience the love that exemplifies your relationship with me, and thus perfect love. And dear one, I want you to have the most wonderful love. I want you to see in the flesh a picture of your relationship with me that I share with the Son. And to enjoy materially and considerably the everlasting union of beauty, perfection, and love that I offer you utterly and for eternity. I am El Shaddai, most loving Father, God Almighty. Believe me and be satisfied. And this goes for Everything we think we need. Food, cars, lodging, family, church, friends. We manipulate to make things work for us, and so we can't leave Egypt. We have to stay here. The second very common area is money. There are people who have sold their souls for riches, and it's, it's staggering. I know of a former church pastor who was in prison for flying drugs out of one of the countries many years ago. We see this today in and out of the church of God, the ecclesia of God. Many people are still very focused on money and things money buys. Look at the things we own. Look at all the things we own. How many of them do we really need or we just like or think we have to have them? I enjoy, in a godly way, listening to my in-laws, my father-in-law, mother-in-law, explain to me the process when they sold their home up in Wisconsin and got rid of everything just about. And I thought, Can I do that? What if God said to you tomorrow, which we faced a lot in international countries, all your vehicles you have, that house you have, you got to start living in a tent and have a motorcycle that will fit in the tent with you. That's your transportation. Uh Oh, he wouldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Oh, by the way, you're not going to get a hot shower every day now. You got to go down to the river and wash, and it's kind of cold. Temperature's nice out, but the water's cold. Look at what we may have as a ministry or a church. Look at what we focus on at the Feast of Tabernacles. Look at what we have to have in our lives as far as physical possessions. Now, they're not wrong to have those things, and I'm very blessed. But are you willing to walk away from it and leave it and do what God says? Are you willing to do that? Compromising your core beliefs for money. Don't say it doesn't affect you because it does. It does. And it will distract us and take us away from God. Another very common area is power and influence. I'm going to tell you a story of a man. We're going to call him Joe. He worked with me when I worked at John Hancock Companies in Tampa, Florida. I lived there in the early 80s, 1980s, way back then. He had a long tenure with the company, aspired to be the one. He told me to sat in the glass office in the corner. He felt he could do a better job than the man who was in there. He told me that. He also told me plainly he wanted the power to make decisions to hire and fire. That's how he'd say it. Joe wanted control. I want to be the VP, the president, the chairman of the board. Anybody know Vince McMahon with WWE? He's quite an interesting individual. You remember another person that said, you're fired! Remember that person? (laughs) 
Vince McMahon would do that too. I'm not picking on him. I don't want to be sued. Just he's publicly known to be that way. What is it we want? I'm going to, one man told me, I'm going to stay here because I'm almost going to, I'm a deacon. I'm going to be an elder soon and then I'll be hired as a pastor someday. I thought, ah, oh, that's, that's your whole goal in life? Well, if your heart's right, okay, but I kind of wonder. Ask God to help you be completely objective in looking at yourself and then be prepared once you start to see it. He may use other people to tell you. He may use your wife, your husband. God forbid this happens, your pastor, step in it. A friend, somebody at work, somebody you don't even know may say something. Where'd you learn to park? Where'd you learn to drive? None ya. Buddy, you got a problem with that? Well, I'm just saying you're parked over three parking spaces. Whatever your weakness is, you can be sure that where your adversary will tempt you and you'll face challenges to do what is right and obey God. What are you going to do? The lesson? You cannot worship God by staying exactly like we were or you are. So why did God require the Israelites to come out of Egypt? This is another interesting thought here. They had to move in order to inherit what God had promised them. Exodus 12, 25. Let's go back there and see what did God promise that? When did where did God promise this? Exodus 12 and verse 25. It shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according to he has promised that you shall keep this service. Back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 to 8. That's what I want to read. Moreover, he said, I am the God of the father of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I'm coming down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them out of the land into a good land, a large into a land flowing with milk and honey, probably pretty sticky, under the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the dog bites, the mosquito bites, right? All the bites, or the ites, or the Vegemites. The original promise was made to Abraham, but they were repeated here to Moses as God was preparing to use him to lead Israel out. They were a promised a land of their own where they would be free to live and worship God without hassle. As long as they continued to worship and obey and they would be blessed in every material way, set a very visible example to the rest of the world as how men were supposed to live in peace and harmony with their Creator. But they obviously couldn't inherit the land promised to them if they stayed in Egypt, could they? They had to leave. It's very likely it took them an entire week to get out of the area of influence of Egypt. God probably parted the Red Sea very possibly on the last day of unleavened bread. So again, the parallel is quite obvious. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, verse 15. Let's start in verse 14. Because the people of God, you and me and I, have been given the challenge to become something different, something holy. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion? Okay, that word... Koimonia in Greek means fellowship, has light with darkness. What concord has Christ with Belial, or what part has he believed with an infidel? And what agreement, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate. 
says the Lord, do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We can't come out of society that we live in completely, can we? In some special place like Israel literally came out of Egypt. But we can come out of the system of beliefs and practice which are contrary to the laws of God. Do we do that? Or do we like what we like? I like that TV show. I like that. I like that restaurant. I like that. Pick whatever it is. Romans chapter 8. These days, the lesson is we have got to leave Egypt. We have to come out of it, out of its ways. You can keep making excuses. Keep making excuses. Oh, God will understand. Oh, He understands. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you through the sport, the Spirit do kill, mortify the deeds of the body, you will live eternally. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, O oh, Dad! Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. There's a difference that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, then heirs of God and join heirs with Christ so that we suffer with Him. Oh, this is a terrible one I'm going through. He says, you're suffering. He went through that, that we may be glorified together. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What a great and glorious promise. No one can claim that promise if he's content to just stay where he or she is doing whatever comes naturally. And honestly, some of us need to stop and say, why am I like this? I need to stop it and repent. So he puts us through situations or allows it to see what we're going to do. What do we do? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 says, Jesus Christ is our high priest, is a mediated a better covenant founded on better promises. I'll say, Israel was promised a physical land and physical blessings. All things physical are our necessity, temporary. How many of you remember what we had to eat on the night to be much observed? Was it good? How many of you got up the next morning and were hungry and ate again? We're going to have a potluck today. Very good chance tonight or by tomorrow morning you're going to eat again because you're hungry. It's always funny after the Day of Atonement, people eat all this massive amounts of food the night before to make sure that they don't get hungry the next day and it makes it worse because your body's all tummy, all swelled up and then that empties out, you're really in pain. The New Covenant adds a spiritual dimension so much more. So if you're always worried about this and that, this thing, that thing, all these physical things, and that can also mean Family, friends all around you, a mate, husband or wife, a church. you got to be part of it. You have a lot of people. can't have a congregation of 10, 12 people or 15 people. Why, it's got to be to be viable 50 or 100 or 500 or 50,000, whatever your thing is. Hebrews chapter 9, let's go over there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant, that by means of death, through the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of what? Not temporary, but eternal inheritance. 
Sometimes God allows things that we have to be taken away from us. Things, jobs, cars, people, churches, friends, neighborhoods, countries, elections, <laughs> to try to wake us up. By the way, I'm going to say this. I want you to listen. If you are locked in picking a candidate for what's coming, you're not seeking God's will. Because God places or removes those that he wants in for his greater will. So if your guy is not the one God wants in there for this nation, for whatever reason, you're going against God. You're wasting lots of energy and time to read, follow, post, be convicted of this is our guy and this guy's a dirt ball. Jesus Christ said, and I, I, I know I'm a broken record, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, then would my servants fight. We are ambassadors supposed to be for Jesus the Christ and God the Father. We're not a Republican. We're not a Democrat. We're not a what is neutral. Whatever you are, you would do well. We would all do well to stay out of it and be immersed in following what God says to do. But that's part of the system we don't want to come out of. It's affected us. The Sabbath fellowship for meals is not the time to get into who your favorite candidate is. And go on and on and on. It's not. That's not uplifting. That's not godly. But we do. Ephesians chapter 4, we're almost done. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth do not walk as other nations walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, law-breaking liberalism to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned of Christ." If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ, put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which is corrupt according to a deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. We can't do that if we stay in Egypt. We have to be in the process, that's what these days teach us, continually putting out the old person, the old man, putting in the new. This morning I had unleavened bread, and when I took it, and if you don't eat it with every meal, shame on you. You need to be. I took a couple pieces of that, and as I chewed that, I thought, I need Christ in me, and the old man needs to leave Egypt. Getting rid of us and eating of the unleavened bread and putting Christ in us. It's the same concept of unleavened bread, just different words. It is the change, the coming out, the leaving Egypt. As I mentioned at the Passover service here in Spanish Fort, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a time of celebration and joy. It's a time of new beginnings. People say, I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. Well, here's a new God calendrical resolution starting today during these days of Unleavened Bread. Don't just stay how we are and where we are Worship our God in spirit and in truth. You can't stay in spiritual Egypt. And you have to make the hard decisions and then 
come out. What will it take for you to stop doing some of the things you do and think and live? One of the hardest ones for me was being forced out of where I thought I needed to be. And I praise God for doing that and thank Him. But I know some, never going to happen. And in our lives, a decision, you cannot inherit the promises made if we remain as we are. You can't stay there and just float through. Because God will either allow or you will be put in a situation where you are forced to make a decision. Choose this day, as Joshua said, whom you will serve. The living God or all the other things that we have in this society become part of us. Let's focus on and strive a little bit more this year than last. As 1 Corinthians 5.8 says, to keep the feast, not with the old leaven, with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's, brethren, as the children of God, leave Egypt. Can we do that? God shows us how to leave. He's called us to understand finding our way out. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and with Christ in us, we can. May we echo the same and be about our Father's business. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you so very much that you are our Father. We thank you for what this days, these days represent from the Passover and the night to be observed and then the days of unleavened bread. We have two more days here yet. Help us to carry on that lesson that we've learned today and this lesson. Give us the strength to make the hard decisions. Let's evaluate. Look at our lives closely and say, Father, this has not been what you would have chosen for me for us and then leave Egypt and walk in faith trusting him that he'll provide what's needed in every aspect of our lives but we can't stay the way we are you cannot stay just the way you are sweet Jesus we can't so we ask you for the strength we come to you and ask for that we ask your blessing we pray you'll bless the meal we're about to partake of Father, encourage us, help us, strengthen us, help us to seriously evaluate where we are. And then, as Paul said, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and step out on faith and make the hard decisions knowing you'll give us the strength to do it. So we love you. We thank you for this time together. We ask your dismissal. Pray that you'll protect those that are suffering and encourage them, lift them up, and help them. We ask all of this in the name and by the authority of Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One. Amen.